Ladies and gentlemen, would you please take your seats? Please welcome the Jake Wish and Kenninger Director of Athletics, Bernard Muir. Good evening, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure to have you tonight to welcome and induct eight members into the Stanford Hall of Fame. Uh, it is a tremendous honor. It feels like a reunion just looking outside and seeing everyone reacquaint themselves with each other. Uh, we look forward to hearing the stories, and we hope you will tell all stories uh, tonight with our eight inductees. But before we, we turn our attention to them, we want to just give you a quick update on what's going on on the farm and what has transpired. Last year, we were fortunate to win seven NCAA and seven national championships, six NCAA titles, which gives our total to 123 NCAA titles. If you're wondering, that does place us number one in the country. Uh, number two is far behind and will never catch us. And that is the plan. I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our student athletes and our coaches who represent the 36 varsity sports that make up Stanford Athletics. Many of our coaches are here tonight and could we give them a quick round of applause. I also wanted to say thank you to our former coaches and our former student athletes, student athlete alums that are back. Uh, we owe you a round of gratitude for all the hard work that you put in to build a foundation that we now celebrate. We have 25 Director's Cups behind us and it's your work, your handiwork that allowed this to happen. And for that, we want to give you a round of applause. 
we know these inductees did not do this on their own. We know that there are many family members, there are many former coaches, there are many friends that are in the audience as well. And for that, we want to say thank you and another round of applause for, for being here. I want to thank the Daper Investment Fund for sponsoring this event, for putting on a, a wonderful function for us tonight. I also want to take special mention and thank Helen Bing, who is sitting right here, for providing such a wonderful forum for us to, in which to celebrate this great occasion. So Helen, thank you. We do have some past Hall of Famers as well who have been inducted, and we would love for them to stand and be recognized. It is great to have you back. So past Hall of Famers. And we'll get this program started. And first, before we look ahead and listen to the great stories of these eight inductees, we want to show you a quick highlight of what's transpired on the farm of late. And with that, enjoy the evening. Thank you. Here it comes over again. Just like I know it starts to descend. It's coming up into the sky. This is our time to make it all right. We're in this together forever. And I know that this feeling will come. Please welcome our Master of Ceremonies, Scott Reese. This is so cool, uh, seeing this group of people all together at this venue. This is just a tremendous event. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Reese. I'm entering my seventh season as radio voice of the Stanford football and men's basketball teams. Uh, I'm also class of 93 and co-term 94, so as a Stanford alum, I am so thrilled to have this opportunity to host this 2019 Hall of Fame ceremony to honor eight amazing former student athletes, some of whom I was fortunate enough to see perform, all of whom have excelled both in the classroom and of course in their respective sports. Everybody in this room can appreciate what it takes just to be a Stanford student athlete. And these young men and women blessed with so much talent and the work ethic to maximize that talent. Genetic freaks of nature, really. The best of the best. So to be branded a Stanford Hall of Famer, well, that means you are, by extension, the best of the best of the best. You made an impact not only on your coaches and your teammates, but on this great university, on the Pac-12, Pac-10, Pac-8 conference, whatever it was at the time, and in many cases, an impact on the entire nation. I know what it feels like to leave Stanford and then to return to Stanford, and coming back here truly does feel like coming home. After today, our new class of inductees will have permanent residence here in this place that gave all of us so, so much. So congratulations to all of you for your accomplishments, for being tremendous ambassadors to Stanford University. And thank you to everybody in this room, and there's so many of you who contributed to their success along the way. Before we begin, I do want to pay tribute to John Ralston, who passed away this last week. So. 
John, as I'm sure you all know, is a Stanford Hall of Famer. He guided the Cardinal football team to consecutive Rose Bowl victories, 1971 and 1972. He was inducted to the College Football Hall of Fame in 1992. John helped revive what was then a struggling program with his relentless enthusiasm, work ethic, and positive attitude, and the university is forever grateful. So please join me in a moment of silence. Okay, we have eight tremendous student athletes to get to, but before we do that, we would like to pay special recognition to a truly amazing individual. The Honorable George P. Schultz is with us here tonight. Mr. Schultz is the Thomas W. and Susan B. Ford Distinguished Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He served under three presidents. He was the Secretary of State for Ronald Reagan from 1982 through 1989. In 1989, he was awarded the nation's highest civilian honor, the Medal of Freedom. Mr. Schultz graduated from Princeton in 1942. He earned his PhD from MIT, where he later taught until 1957. He then joined the faculty of the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business, becoming dean in 1962. In 1968 and 69, he became a fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Sciences here at Stanford and has been a key figure and supporter of the university ever since. An ardent supporter of football and basketball, Mr. Schultz has also raised money for the men's and women's golf programs by hosting the Schultz Cup for the last 30 years. Thank you, George, so much for all of your support and contributions and for paving the, the way for so many. And as a special treat, Mr. Schultz is going to address the audience here tonight. Thank you. I remember once running into Andrew Luck. He was here for his senior year. And I said, congratulations, did you go pro? You stayed around to finish up. He said, of course, what else would I do? He was a real student athlete. But I said to him, the way you play football is different when I played football. It was a long time ago in the early 40s. I said, when I played football, when you left the game, you couldn't come back in until the following quarter. So everybody played both ways, offense and defense. They couldn't send plays in from the outside, no coaching from the sidelines, prohibited. So you brought information back into the huddle. It was a real huddle. You gave it to the quarterback. The quarterback called the play. And he said, I said, now somebody in the stand sends it a play. He said, well, they send one in, but if I don't like it, I change it. <laughs> so I said, well, here's a leader. And that's one thing about sports. It teaches you something about leadership. Then there's also the importance of accountability. In all organizations and in your life, accountability is an important attribute. And sports teaches that more than almost anything. If you, are, you mentioned the golf program, there you are on the green. You hold the putter. There is the ball. There is the cup. You hit the ball. When the ball stops rolling, the result is unambiguous. Relentless accountability. But accountability is something that carries you through life. And then another attribute that sports teaches you is trust. Because you have teammates, and you get to know them, and you rely on them. Everybody has to do their part. And you trust your teammates to do their part in order for the play to work. So trust is very important in life. Trust is the coin of the realm. And then, as I said, there's leadership. And sports teaches you how important it is to have somebody out there who gives leadership and inspiration. And you need that everywhere. So I'm very honored to have this award because I have such a high regard for the importance of sports. It isn't like there's Stanford University and sports teams. The sports is an integral part of education, and it teaches the things that other parts of the university only touch on. So here's to sports. And with that, our first inductee tonight 
is women's volleyball standout Faluka Akinradwa. She began her career with Stanford by being named Pac-10 Freshman of the Year in 2005 and finished as one of the most distinguished performers in program history. She became the seventh four-time AVCA All-American in school history and during her junior year in 2007 and senior year in 2008 was named Pac-10 and National Player of the Year. As a senior, Faluka was nominated for the Honda Award for a third consecutive year. She finished her collegiate career with a 446 hitting proficiency mark, the highest of any NCAA Division I player. After graduating from Stanford with a human biology degree, Faluka continues to play professional volleyball. She has earned numerous awards and titles, including Best Spikers in Japan, MVP in Switzerland for Volvo Zurich, and was named Best Spiker, Best Blocker, and MVP during her time in Japan from 2017 through 2019. She also competed in the 2012 London Olympic Games and won a silver medal, along with the award of Best Middle Blocker at the 2016 Rio Olympic Games. Faluka's presenter tonight is former Stanford teammate Agana Namani Silva. Please welcome Agana and Faluke. Wow, congratulations, Faluke. I'm so proud of you. I guess they only gave me two minutes, so I can't throw you under the bus. And you have a baby due, so I want to be able to see your baby. So that's why I'm not going to throw you under. But it's a true honor to be here today to introduce Faluke. As you all know, she's an outstanding athlete. And her dominance right when she started playing volleyball was, was evident and she just continued to dominate at every level of the game. And she picked up so fast, and she's a true talent. I was in awe of her. I didn't have the chance to play with her here at Stanford, but I tried to make it happen, but my eligibility ran out. So I said, you know what, let me try and stay on the national team a little bit longer so I'll have the chance to play with her. And I got to know her as a person, and she's one of my best friends. I think for me, what makes me proud to know Faluke is not her volleyball talents, but she's an outstanding, incredible human being. And she is so funny. We have so much time, so much fun together. We'd laugh and talk, and the coaches actually split us apart. They'd never allow us to be roommates because we wouldn't sleep. But then what would happen is the coach would come by the room and we'd be there laughing. So it didn't really work out. <laughs> The stories I have, but I won't share, are, are pretty good. Um, and, and again, I want to congratulate you, and I feel like your future is limitless because of your talents. Your talents are transferable in anything that you'll do, and it's a true honor to know you, and it's a, it's a true honor to see you receive this award, and I am so, so proud of you. Um, it's great. Well, congratulations, and I love you very much, and I can't wait to hear your speech. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I am so pleased to be here today. It is such an honor and pleasure to be here. To the inductees, congratulations. I am truly in the presence of greatness. Um, my dream of attending Stanford formulated when I was 11 years old. My brother ran track and field for the University of Oregon, and he had a track meet here at Stanford. And we lived in Fresno at the time, so I remember my family, we piled into the minivan and we drove over here to the farm to cheer him on. And uh, during the competition, excuse me, they had a thing for the kids there. It was a 200 meter competition, and I've always been the shy kid, so I didn't want to go, but my parents urged me on to just give it a try and give it my best and see what happened. And so I ran in the race and I won. And at the end, there was a volunteer working the meet. And she said, hey, we'll see you back here competing for Stanford one day. And after that, I was sold. And attending Stanford became a silent dream of mine. And I tucked it away and put it in the category of things that might not actually happen. And it's a lofty dream, but man, it'd be amazing if it did. 
And um, so growing up, I played basketball and I ran track. And I've always been really tall and I've had the ability to jump and I was relatively quick, which really spoke to those sports. And so in my mind, I was gonna play basketball or run track in college and maybe if the lofty dream came true, I'd play in the Olympics in one of those sports. But God and Coach Lisa Zielinski had different plans. And so um, my freshman year at my high school, when the high school coach, Coach Z, came up to me asking me if I wanted to play, bas or to play volleyball, I politely declined because basketball was my thing. There was no way I was gonna play another sport, but she would not let it go. And she nagged and she persisted and any chance she got, she would ask me if I could play. And in my mind, like I was gonna play basketball in college and to top it off, I think anyone who's played basketball their whole lives, they know they don't wanna wear short shorts. So that was not my thing. I just wasn't gonna do it. But to get her off my back, I finally acquiesced my sophomore year and I gave it a shot and she put me on the varsity team and I had no business being there. Um, when I tell you I was atrocious, that's an understatement. But um, I was on the varsity team and I was clearly there for my ability to jump um, and my height, but she put so much faith in me and so much work and effort in the coaching staff there and over time I became a half decent player and my love for the sport continued to grow. And so Coach Z, who's here tonight, who flew all the way from Florida, thank you so much for being here. And my career in volleyball would not have been possible without you. I wouldn't be standing here today if not for you. And um, yeah, I just thank you for everything. Love you. Um, and so by my junior year in high school, um, coaches were finally starting to take interest in me and when I found out that Stanford was interested, I couldn't contain my excitement because that dream that had been formulated back when I was 11 years old was finally coming to fruition and I, could, I couldn't believe it. Um, but I played basketball and I ran track and I didn't play club volleyball, which is where one is typically recruited for the sport because it fell during high school season. And even though my love for volleyball was growing immensely, I wasn't quite ready to give up those sports yet. And so coaches had to go through unorthodox ways um, to recruit me. And so I remember Denise Corlett came to one of my uh, basketball games uh, during the winter, which is obviously um, unorthodox for a volleyball coach to do, but they put that much, um, you know, interest in me and they had a lot of faith in me. And even though I'd only been playing for the sport for three years, um, they gave me opportunity to come to Stanford. And I am so grateful for that. And I, you know, I didn't have a lot of abilities per se, but they saw something in me that I didn't necess necessarily see in myself. And I'm so grateful that John and Denise gave me this opportunity to come to the farm. Um, and they, uh, for the next four years, I put so much work into my development as a player and growth. And um, I honestly would not be standing here today if not for them as well, for giving me a chance to come to the farm. And so I'm so grateful for them. Uh, I'd also like to thank the medical staff and strength conditioning staff for holding me together for those four years because I know I was a hot mess and, <laughs> and they kept it together for me. I'd also like to thank Adam and Kristen Keith, my fantastic scholarship donors, for affording me the opportunity to get, earn a degree from this prestigious university. And I was drawn to volleyball for a numerous amount of reasons, but the main thing being the team aspect of the sport. You need every single person on the court in order to succeed. Um, I can't attack the ball if I don't have a good set. The setter can't set the ball if she doesn't have a good pass and et cetera. And so even though I'm standing here today and I'm being awarded this honor, I wouldn't be here without my teammates. And over our time at Stanford, we had so much fun with one another. Um, we had countless locker room dance parties. Inji Namani was definitely the one choreographing dances for us back then. And also during tough times, we were able to lean on one another. And so I'm so grateful for them. And they helped me grow. I, I truly, truly grew up at Stanford and I can thank them from that. And again, I was always bummed that we never got an opportunity to play with each other at Stanford. One, two, one year too late on my end and yours as well. But I'm so grateful for the time we had together on the national team. And you know, we formed a bond that can never be broken and stories and that we can't share with others, but we'll never forget. And I truly look at you as an older sister and I am so honored to be here with you tonight and with everyone here, all these you know, amazing people to be in the same room. I'm truly blessed and humbled.
I'd like to thank my parents um, for all of their sacrifices and for supporting me with everything I've done in life. My parents immigrated from, um, to North America from Nigeria back in the 80s to give their children opportunities that they didn't have for themselves. And they left their friends and family and the sacrifices they've made. I'm so grateful for that. And um, everything I do in life is really, you know, because of you guys and the sacrifices you've made for me. So thank you so much. To my brothers, thank you for allowing me to play with the boys when I was younger. You guys toughened me up big time. And um, I'm so grateful for you both. Um, to Bob and Mary Gunnarsson, my in-laws, I truly won the lotto having you guys as parents. And I thank you so much for being here and your support means everything. Um, to my family also, the Hills and Kelsey, my sister-in-law, thank you for being here and for your support. And to my husband, Jonathan, even though we weren't fortunate enough to meet at Stanford, I am so grateful and blessed that we, we met nonetheless. And um, I know that with our, the new chapter in our lives, with the baby on the way, and my aspirations of making the 2020 Olympic team, I know anything is possible because of you. And I thank you for your encouragement and for making me be the best version of myself every day. And above all, I'd like to thank God for his, um, his blessings, never ending grace. And to the Stanford Athletics and Dapper Investment Fund, thank you for hosting this fabulous event and seeing me worthy of this prestigious award. Thank you. Our next honoree is the 46th baseball player to be inducted into the Stanford Hall of Fame. It's a pretty good roster. Jeff Austin was a three-year letter winner from 1996 through 1998. He helped the Cardinal win 128 games over that stretch, at least 40 in all three seasons. In each of those years, Stanford qualified for an NCAA regional. The 1997 team earned the program's 10th trip to Omaha for the College World Series. In his junior year, he was named Baseball America National Player of the Year. Jeff left the farm having pitched 309 and two-thirds innings with a 3.61 ERA and 317 strikeouts. Following his career at Stanford, he was selected as the fourth overall pick in the 1998 Major League Baseball draft by the Kansas City Royals. He appeared in 38 Major League games across three seasons with the Royals and the Cincinnati Reds. Jeff then returned to the farm as pitching coach in 2008 and 2009, and the first of those teams went back to the College World Series. Tonight, Jeff's former pitching coach, Tom Dutton, will present his award. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Austin. It's my honor to honor my uh, good friend and past pitching performance, Jeff Austin. When he called me and asked me to present him, I was thrilled to death. He's been a huge uh, influence on our program and uh, he's added so much to uh, everybody involved with Stanford baseball. His, his signature pitch, which is something that should be described once in a while is a curveball. And all of you that have played baseball have desires and anxious to throw one and, and have tried, but it's not that easy. And he has developed that thing and that was his uh, claim to fame. But I couldn't be honored more than to be here this afternoon. And I couldn't have a, a player that I've coached in all my years here and that I feel strongly, more strongly than I do about Jeff. Thanks, Coach. I'd like to thank my assistant, Jordan. Jordan, you want to step out here and say hi to everybody? Nope, you're going to hide behind the podium, no problem. Thanks, Coach. Congratulations to my fellow inductees, their families, 
and everyone that had a hand in creating opportunities for these fine former student athletes and incredible individuals to achieve success. Thank you to the donors. Without the support of, I never would have had the opportunity to compete wearing Cardinal Red. I'm incredibly humbled and honored to be here, and I'm also not entirely convinced there hasn't been some mistake. <laughs> I was a pretty good pitcher. I had a pretty good curveball. You heard Coach Dunton talk about that. But honestly, any recognition should be redirected to the teams on which I played in Stanford Athletics as a whole. I'm merely a beneficiary of the excellence perpetuated by the stellar athletic department and university. Today, I'd like to speak about three things, gratitude, intensity, and belief. Gratitude. Paulo Coelho and the Alchemist wrote that when a person really desires something, all the universe conspires to help that person realize his dream. It was my dream to play baseball for Stanford University. And I had the pleasure and unique opportunity to experience Stanford baseball in two different decades. The first is a player and the second is a coach. Pretty proud that that picture up there is actually for me coaching, not playing. I feel like I look okay in that uniform. <laughs> um, when I coached at Stanford, I saw firsthand the hours of work and sometimes thankless effort that the coaches put in. And without those individuals, the talent, enthusiasm, and potential of the athletes they coach would be lost. This was certainly the case with me. Coach Marquis, Dunton, Stotts, Nakama, Esker, thank you for all that you did for me and every athlete fortunate enough to be coached by you. Baseball is a team sport. My father used to say that the best thing a great pitcher can do is tie a baseball game. Without the efforts of my teammates, I'm certainly not here before you today. I'm grateful for all of them. Teammates like former Stanford, uh, excuse me, f uh, fellow Stanford Hall of Famer A.J. Hinch, most recently famous for leading the Houston Astros to a World Series victory in 2017, less notably known for dousing me with hotel waste baskets filled with ice water over the shower curtain repeatedly on road trips my freshman year. <laughs> when I was a freshman and he was a senior. Thank you to teammates like Chad Hutchinson, former Stanford pitcher and quarterback who had more athletic ability perhaps than anyone I've ever met. Hall of Famers like John Gall and Kyle Peterson and athletes and my friends, Marcy Crouch, Joe Savig, Todd Carter, Josh Hokusang, Tony Kogan, John Salter, Jody Garrett, I'm grateful for all of you. Truman Capote wrote in the novella, Breakfast at Tiffany's, anyone who ever gave you confidence, you owe them a lot. So the one of those influential figures, not only in my baseball career, but my life, my pitching coach at Stanford, the man known only as the Colonel, Tom Dunton, thank you. The Colonel was a psychologist, he was a strength and conditioning coach, and the guru who recently saw another one of his protégés, Mike Messina, inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. I was luckily, lucky to have been around Coach Dunton, and I'm grateful for every bit of advice and tutelage you imparted during our time together. Intensity. Joe Torre, former Yankees manager, said, competing at the highest level is not about winning. It's about preparation, courage, understanding and nurturing your people, and heart. Winning is the result. My wife tells me I have an intense personality. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> I think that between head coach Mark Marquis and another intense individual, my mom, who's also here, I learned how to care so deeply about things that I developed that intensity. So apologies to my wife. Sorry, honey, but maybe I can blame them. They're sitting right, right over there. I'll never be as tough as my mom, nor have I ever met a stronger, more determined person who carried themselves with such grace under pressure. She was given three months to live in 1987 when she was diagnosed with cancer. She went on to beat cancer and raise two kids while simultaneously founding her own company. They're a medical journal, yeah. Mom. There are medical journals written about what a miracle she is, but I already knew. Let's talk about another intense individual, Coach Marquis. He said on many occasions that fear is the greatest motiv motivator. And whether you believe that or not, Jordan, don't touch that trophy. <laughs> so Coach Marquis says that fear is the greatest motivator. And it worked for me. I was terrified as a player and even as a member of his coaching staff. But I wasn't scared of him. I was terrified of not fulfilling his crystal clear expectations that we would not be the greatest baseball program, not every season or every single game, but every pitch and in between, and we wouldn't do it, with, with, we wouldn't do it the right way. Coach Marcus, your attention to detail and passion for excellence is unparalleled. 
I appreciate you believing in us. Belief. Jason Bercy in A Walk with Prudence says, when you believe in someone, you profoundly increase their ability to have faith in themselves and achieve. When you love someone, you imprint on their heart something so powerful that it changes the trajectory of their life. When you do both, you set into motion a gift to the world because those who are believed in and loved understand the beauty of a legacy and the absolute duty of paying it forward. In closing, I'll leave you with the words from a wise character, a literary, ch literary children's classic written by A.A. Milne, Winnie the Pooh, which was shockingly not on my reading list as a Stanford English major, but it's a staple in my nighttime reading routine to my children. Eeyore says that a little consideration and a little thought for others makes all the difference. To my teammates, coaches, the athletic department at Stanford University, to those who believed in me and considered or thought that I would make a difference, I can only hope that I'm lucky enough to pass along that same gift to others one day. Thank you. Bernard, can we pencil in Jordan Austin for induction in 2049? 125-pound <laughs> athletes do not usually strike fear in the hearts of opponents. Tanner Gardner, very much an exception. The overall school leader, all-time wrestling wins with 145. One of only two three-time All-Americans in program history. Tanner set a Stanford record during his senior year in 2008 with 43 victories and 19 pins, finishing a career-high fifth in the NCAA championships. He won consecutive Pac-10 titles in 2007 and 2008. A man of many firsts, he became the inaugural Stanford wrestler to post multiple 40-win campaigns. Tanner ended his career with an overall record of 145 and 38, went 53 and 8 in dual matches. In 2016, he was selected to the Pac-12's All-Century team. Tanner was also a three-time academic All-American and earned degrees in public policy and in sociology. He went on to complete his MBA from Harvard Business School and is currently the Chief, Chief Operating Officer for Athletics at Rice University. Tanner's presenter tonight is his former Stanford wrestling coach, Kerry McCoy. So please welcome Tanner Gardner. Good evening, everyone. I'm very honored to stand here today to recognize such a wonderful human being, wonderful man, wonderful person. Um, I was Tanner's head coach uh, for his sophomore, junior, and senior year. And I can say that he was one of the people through my coaching career that I spoke about most. And some of those characteristics I'll talk about tonight. Um, first of all, one of the things that helped him to be successful, and I'm preaching to the choir, but just the atmosphere here at Stanford. Uh, when he was a sophomore, he became an All-American and um, first time All-American as a sophomore. And I literally thought we were going to get back on the farm. There was going to be a ticker tape parade. You know, we got an All-American in wrestling. It's going to be exciting. And not many people batted an eye at it. And it was uh, not any disrespect to Tanner, but it was the idea of the amount of success that was here at Stanford. So in order for him to really leave his mark, he knew that just being a one-time All-American wasn't going to be it. So he became our program's first three-time All-American. So... Um, his foundation, his preparation, uh, he comes from a great family and, and Doug and Mimi can teach a master class on how to raise a collegiate athlete, how to be collegiate athletic parents. Um, if they disagreed with many things, I didn't know about it too much because they, they knew how to keep the balance, but they had their way, especially Doug, you know, of coming and say, hey, uh, maybe you should think about this or maybe he can do this, but in a way that it never felt um, overbearing. And that definitely translated to Tanner in his foundation. Now, his actual activity was a little more overbearing than, uh, than his parents probably would have liked, but definitely had the good foundation. But his foundation was also grounded in his faith. 
And, you know, we're talking 10, 15 years ago, um, for athletes to, to share their, their faith, it wasn't as, as accepted as it is now. And he was never ashamed. And, and that was something that I felt like was really special and helped him to be the success that he is today. Um, but really, individually, why he is being inducted today, um, you may, may not know, but Tanner never lost a competition anytime we had a race, if it was a game, if it was anything in practice, he never lost. He won all the time, at least according to him. Um, he never gave up a takedown in practice. He never lost a match in practice. Um, so it was, uh, it was just that attitude for him, and, and uh, he always knew how to push himself. And win, lose, or draw, he always won. So it was really exciting for him to, uh, for me to be a part of that time. And during the, our relationship, we had a great interaction. We had great times back and forth. And they weren't always rosy and always uh, sunshine and rainbows, but we always knew that we had each other's backs. And it was just an honor to, uh, to coach him. And I only have two minutes to talk, so I won't get into any other stories. But if you get a chance to grab Tanner, ask him about the, uh, the Vegas trip with the, uh, with the sweatpants. So, um, <laughs> so without further ado, please join me in inducting, welcoming Tanner Gardner for his induction to the Stanford Athletic Hall of Fame. Thank you, Coach McCoy. It's, a, it's an honor to have you introduce me today. Uh, you're one of the many folks who's had a profound impact on my life. And um, congratulations to, to all the inductees that I'm alongside. I think Stanford uh, is a place that's all about excellence. And to be part of that and to be next to that uh, is just really an amazing thing. Thank you to the athletic department and the committee who uh, inducted me and us. And uh, thank you to the Daper Investment Fund for putting this on. Um, in my short time this evening, uh, I want to touch on two topics. Uh, one is excellence and the other is gratitude. Um, Stan Stanford certainly impacted me in many, many ways, but one of those ways that was most impactful and really sticks with me today and informs how I live my life is, uh, is something that I learned on the farm is what it means to be truly excellent. Uh, I think being a Division I student athlete at many schools, uh, you're forced to make a trade-off. Uh, you're you're called to be great at athletics, and if that means sacrificing other important things like academics, character development, uh, then sometimes that's just how it is. Well, that's not the case at Stanford. I felt like at Stanford, we were always called to a higher standard. Um, yeah, we were always called to be great at athletics, and I think that's apparent uh, year in and year out here, but we were also called to be great in the classroom and great young men and women. Uh, on the mat, I had coaches that uh, demanded a lot of me, pushed me hard, and, and took me places that I never thought I could go. In the classroom, I had professors who, on one hand, respected that I was a student athlete, but on the other hand, uh, would never give me a break, but would come alongside me to help me be great. Uh, outside of that, and extracurricularly, I was fortunate to be part of a student athlete uh, Christian ministry called Cardinal Life, where another Hall of Famer, Steve Stenstrom, uh, called us to be great men and women of God. Uh, and so just this comprehensive package of excellence uh, was something that I felt called to uh, every single day at Stanford, and it's something that I try to embody in my life today and also uh, teach to everyone that I come in touch with. Um, I think a common thing across all my lessons of excellence was the part that other people played in them, so uh, gratitude is something that, that I want to talk about because they're, you know, I believe we're a, we're a function and, and who we are is largely informed by uh, other people, and so you know, there, there's so many people who had impacts on my life um, first, being a man of faith, uh, I want to thank Jesus who, who guides my path. Uh, second, I can't thank my family enough. I mean, Carrie alluded to them. I, I think I, had, I have two of the greatest parents ever who taught me uh, what it means to work hard and what it means to be a good person. Uh, I had siblings who would travel around the country, uh, often when they didn't want to, uh, and support me well in my endeavors. Um, I, you know, my wife, who I didn't know uh, when I was a wrestler, uh, but now is uh, someone who challenges me, me to be excellent today and someone who I think is more deserving of an honor like this. Um, to my coaches, I was fortunate to train under many great coaches, uh, Carrie being one of them who uh, put up with a lot of uh, difficult things with me, but always would call me to a higher standard and hold the line uh, because he knew what was best for me. Uh, I thank Coach Steve Buddy who recruited me and gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. I'm thankful uh, that he's here tonight. And then, uh, you know, a number of impactful assistant coaches, uh, Jason Borelli, who's now the head coach here, who uh, trained with me probably 365 days from the time he got here. 
uh, and then Kevin Clem, who was also helpful to uh, recruit me here. I think the, these are people who, uh, you know, realizing that I wasn't the easiest person to deal with always, would constantly be with me, beside me, uh, and push me to be great. Um, I think like Jeff said, you know, our teammates make who we are, and even in an individual sport like wrestling, that's the case. Uh, I have a number of them who are in attendance tonight who uh, just grinded with me in the wrestling room. We, we'd push each other, and we'd call each other to be great. And I think one of the great things about sports is you get to be part of teams, uh, and you get to learn from other people. And so I think one, one of the greatest things about that was I got to be a sponge around other people and learn, hey, what makes you great? What makes you great? And that wasn't just for wrestlers. That was for everyone. Uh, so I'm thankful uh, for those people who uh, did battle with me while I'm at Stanford and then uh, the people who do battle with me today, some of which are in attendance tonight, uh, is great. And then finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention two gentlemen who have had a profound impact on my professional career, uh, Bob Bowlesby and Joe Carlgaard. Uh, in fact, Joe's here tonight. Uh, he's the athletic director at Stanford, uh, made a 24-hour trip uh, out here, so that, that means a lot. Um, there are a lot of other people who impacted me who are deserving a mention, uh, and thank you to them as well. Like I said, I think we're truly a product of those around us. Uh, and I'm forever grateful to those people who shaped my life. Uh, today in my profession, I have the great fortune of getting to work in college athletics uh, at Rice University. Uh, college athletics is something that really changed my life, and so to have the opportunity to work in an, an environment where I can pay that forward is, is really a dream come true. So with considerable gratefulness uh, for this honor uh, and to everyone who came here to support us today, uh, thank you very much and God bless. So only one of our inductees, to the best of my knowledge, actually played pickup basketball this morning uh, back here on the Stanford campus. Anybody have an idea who that might be? True story. Mad Dog. If ever a nickname perfectly described the fire and fiery and competitive nature of a student athlete, this was it. East Bay product Mark Madsen forever impacted the Cardinal during his time at Stanford from 1996 through 2000. During his four-year career, he was named All-America and Pac-10 twice. He is ranked number four in school history with a career field goal percentage of 587, number six in rebounds with 857. And then, of course, there is the signature moment. March 22nd, 1998. If you were a Stanford fan at the time, you will never forget where you were watching the Elite Eight game against Rhode Island. Down eight, under a minute to go and one of the most amazing comebacks in NCAA tournament history. Mark Madsen with the dunk and foul and ensuing free throw and pounding the chest. Stanford goes to the Final Four for the first time since 1942. In 2000, Madsen was selected in the first round of the NBA draft by the LA Lakers. He was the 29th overall pick. He helped them win NBA titles in 2001 and 2002, and then he danced with Shaq. Repeatedly. Mark played in the NBA for nine seasons, and then he came home to the farm in 2012 as an assistant coach to the Cardinal men's basketball team while earning his MBA. He went on to become the head coach of the defenders of the D-League down in LA, as well as an assistant coach with the Lakers. And now he is the head coach of Utah Valley in the Western Athletic Conference. George Foster, GSB professor and former teacher and mentor to Mark, will present his award tonight. Please welcome Mark Madsen and George Foster. Well, welcome. It's, uh, this is uh, a real honor to celebrate what I would call a truly joyous person. Uh, I think it's a time to look back, but it's also a time to look forward with a lot of confidence and enthusiasm for what will come in the future. Um, my family and uh, Scott and Sally and Debbie have known Mark for probably 20 years, and that's just been a joy in our life. Um, I had the joy of having Mark in four different classes. I don't understand why he signed up for four different classes, but one of the interesting experiences of that is that you'd have guests come into class and they'd say, is that Yes, it is. And then they'd ask, can I get my photo taken with Mark? <laughs> Which is sort of almost unheard of, but it's, uh, we have so many great p 
people in our MBA program, and many of them come back from athletics, that that's just part of the joys of teaching at Stanford. Um, reflecting on his career as an athlete is one thing. Um, he certainly was one of the key leaders in taking that team to a Final Four, and they made the championship four years in a row, which that's pretty amazing for an, a, an institution that has such high standards in a world at which one and done is the norm uh, in terms of the basketball world. And to go to the Final Four, I think we're all cheering for those moments. Um, NBA career, if you can get the meat in the sandwich between Kobe and Shaq and still come out smiling, I think, that says something in terms of, uh, <laughs> in that sort of situation. Uh, his teammates really loved him, whether it was on the college team, uh, the Minnesota team, or the Lakers. You, you listened to them and, and they sort of just said, what a wonderful person. Um, career as a coach, I think, has just started and it's just very lucky for the people up at Utah Valley uh, for what's coming forward. Uh, I actually think it's a wonderful time to look forward to Mark. I've got a lot of confidence in his coaching. If somebody said, what's really one of the most important things a coach does, it's recruit. And if somebody said to me, find a more enthusiastic, somebody bubbling with enthusiasm, infectious sort of uh, love for the sport, but also as a wonderful human being, I don't think you could sort of do anything but other take Mark as your poster child. Uh, on that, um, just one thing, um, Mark is the most positive, enthusiastic person I've ever known. And sometimes I find it's a little unreal that he could be positive so often in a world that's sometimes not, but it's just real and it's authentic. So it's my pleasure to introduce and congratulate Mark, who I call the happiest cardinal that I ever know, uh, on his induction to the Stanford Hall of Fame. George, thank you for that great introduction, and uh, I appreciate all the time and prep you put into the classes of GSB, um, and also the class we took four years prior to that with the NBA, when the NBA players came out here. Really enjoyed that. Um, I want to start by just congratulating every fellow inductee into the Hall of Fame tonight. It's a huge honor. Congratulations to each of you and your families. I want to say thank you to every coach, professor, member of the Stanford community, supporter, here in this room and those that are not in this room. I got here early last night and I, I took a drive around campus. It, it is amazing to see how this campus grows every single year. I haven't been here for four years and I drove by Escondido Village and there are massive buildings <laughs> go, going up. And it is a tribute and a testimony to everyone in this room, to the support you give to this school and it's a tribute to the school. I wanna talk about I think that may be my son back there. <laughs> William, how you doing, buddy? The word I want to talk about tonight is one word, support. When I was growing up, my earliest memory of basketball is my dad taking me out back and having a basketball in his hands and saying, hey, put your arms out. I'm going to throw this to you. Catch it. And I remember I saw the ball coming at me, and I put my arms out, and I caught it. And I was so surprised that I caught it. It, it was just this amazing thing. As I got older, every night my dad would come home from work and he'd say, let's go play one-on-one -on -one in the back. I loved it. I loved it. I lived for those moments. Um, I got to be an eighth grader or ninth grader and the games got intense. The games got a little bit intense. I, I was amazed my dad had the energy to do that. My dad got up at three in the morning every day and commuted from Danville to San Francisco. Um, I'm one of 10 children in my family and so his work ethic and his example was unbelievable. So we would play these games. So I, I got him on a lift fake one night and I said, I, I'm going to draw this foul. So I leaned into him and, and, and he went falling to the ground. I broke his rib. I broke his rib. <laughs> but after my dad got better, he kept on playing one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> and so dad, thank you for your support. You're, you're a great father. Um, I'm going to get to my mom in a second here. But I want to talk about my decision to come here. Uh, my final two schools were UCLA and Stanford. And I had just taken a visit to UCLA, and, and they pressured me to commit. And I, I basically almost committed. And I said, guys, I want to come to UCLA. I, I told the Stanford coach, Mike Montgomery, I told him I'd take a visit next week, and I want to fulfill my commitment. I was going to UCLA. And so I get back to, 
I get, I get on the flight, go back up to Danville, and I was just thinking, I said, you know, why am I even going to take the visit to Stanford? It, it's a great school. It's a great place. The academics are unbelievable, but I'm really thinking about going to UCLA. So I said, I'm going to call Mike Montgomery and bring him over to the house and just, and just get a feel and, and just see if, see if I end up letting him know what I'm thinking. That way, I, I don't waste the time on the visit. So Mike Montgomery comes over to the house, and he walked into the house, and what a great man Mike Montgomery is. So he came in, we're sitting down, we put together the fact that he and my mom went to the same high school in Long Beach, um, but as we were talking, it, 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 was one, it was a very singular experience in my life, but as I was talking, I could just feel the character and the integrity of Mike Montgomery, and it was crazy. I just stood up in the middle of the speech, and I said, I'm coming to Stanford. I'm coming to Stanford. And, and he said, well, we, we have this VHS video to show you a little bit more. I said, I don't need to see the video. <laughs> I said, I'm coming to Stanford. And he said, well, we, we can talk more. I said, Mike, we can talk more. You, you can get home to your family, you, you know. And uh, my freshman year, at one point, I hurt my back, which I also may have tweaked my back this morning in the pickup game. <laughs> But uh, I said to myself, okay, I'm just going to show up to practice, and I'll let Mike know that I can't practice. Well, I came to practice. He pulled me aside. He said, hey, it's fine you hurt your back, but if you hurt your back, you need to let me know sooner because I'm running a program, and I need to be prepared. Mike taught us lessons about life. He gave us support. He gave every teammate support in the program, as did all of the assistant coaches, as did all of the trainers. I want to talk about my mom. I had knee surgery in high school. I felt her support every day. I remember as a, as a junior, I was kind of recovering from, from the surgery and kind of getting better. And my mom, many days, would say, I'm going to bring you a hot lunch to school. And so I'd wait out front. My mom would bring me a plate, a nice glass plate. And she would have a hot lunch. And she would give it to me. And so I'd go sit with my, my friends. And they'd say, how'd you get that hot lunch? I said, my mom dropped it off. <laughs> um, always felt the support from my mom. Five years ago, four or five years ago, I was 39 and single. And I wanted to take the next step in life. I wanted to take the next step of marriage. It, it hadn't worked out. So my mom calls me one night and she says, Mark, I, there, there's someone I met I, I want to line you up with. <laughs> I said, okay. I, I said, hey, let's, let's talk. And so my mom said that she was hosting an event at her home in Utah. My parents had moved from Danville up to Utah. The, the pianist for the night had canceled. And so my mom was trying to find a pianist. So she said to my sister, I need a pianist. My sister said, call in Hannah. Hannah was the piano teacher of her kids. So Hannah knocks on the door. My mom opens it. I don't know if there was much of a greeting, but my mom said, are you single? <laughs> And then she takes Hannah into the house, points at a family portrait on the wall, says, do you think he's cute? <laughs> Ten months later, my wife and I were married. And uh, thank you. I'm grateful to my parents, to my wife, to my, to my in-laws. Lastly, I want to say this. My, my wife and I, we went, to our, we went on our anniversary to Italy. Italy's a wonderful place. We saw bridges that were still standing after hundreds and hundreds of years. We live in a world that sometimes in the history of time, even currently, loves walls. You know, you look at Hadrian's Wall, didn't last. You look at the Berlin Wall, George Scholz, you, you, you played a hand to bring that thing down. You know, in a world that loves walls, here are these bridges that need so many parts to work perfectly. Every stone, every brick, the keystone, they bridge, two, they bridge a gap and bring two sides together. To me, that's what Stanford is. To me, that's what the Stanford basketball team was. Uh, it was a bridge. Every player, every coach was a stone. Every player, every coach had a role. I had a role. Other players had a role. I'm honored to accept this award tonight. It's, it's a team award. It's a team award because what we did as a team would not have been possible without every coach and every player on the team. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
to each of you that are here and the support that you give this school and the support that you gave me. Thank you very much. Our next inductee is former tennis star Susan Hagee Wall, four-time All-American. She teamed with fellow inductee Diane Morrison to capture AIAW titles in 1975 and 1976. In 1978, they led Stanford to a national championship. Now, tennis, tennis runs in her blood. Her father was a top-ranked player, while two siblings also played here at Stanford. At age 16, Susie reached the mixed doubles quarterfinals at Wimbledon and played on center court. In 1975, she advanced to the junior Wimbledon quarterfinals in singles and qualified for singles again in 1977. During the Pan American Games in 1979, she captured gold medals in singles and doubles, and she added a New Zealand Open singles title in 1982. Susie's presenter tonight is her former head coach, Dick Gould. Please welcome Dick and Susie to the stage. Hey, George, you left all your notes up here. <laughs> Susie Hagee, what an honor it is to present her. Uh, a couple of things along the way. Uh, you're right. Susie does have tennis in her blood. She also has Stanford in her blood. Her, as you mentioned, her brother and sister both went here. Her brother was a finalist for our men's team when they won their second national championship and led us to the title. Incredible. It's Carrie played about 10 years later, uh, thereabouts, and... Uh, so she does have Stanford in blood and has had. Uh, she was here at the very start, Diane Morrison as well, the very, very start of Title IX. And going back to those days, a lot of us forgot this, forget the struggle that we all had, some of us as donors, adapting that, conce adopting that concept, uh, just not the Buck Club, but the Buck Cardinal Club to be. And we're all worried about our own worlds and our own sports. My wife, Ann, correction, was Susie's coach. And she was the one who recruited uh, Susie Stanford and, and was the coach of that team that won the first women's national championship in any sport at Stanford. And uh, and quite a, what a run went on after that. But Susie was also the recipient of the first athletic scholarship given to women. There were nine ladies that year. Pat Cornett is in our Hall of Fame for golf. And Susie was one of those nine. She was a leader on this, maybe the best women's tennis team, arguably, in tennis history. They won the first championship, but along with her and Diane Morrison, and a big congrats. Where, Dan, where are you? A tremendous congrats to Diane for all she did for Stanford as well. They were the two-time national collegiate champs, but people forget that in an effort to win their third championship, they met teammates, Barbara and Kathy Jordan, who are here supporting her tonight. Barbara ended up being the a quarterfinalist or semifinalist, I can't remember which, in singles in Wimbledon. Uh, excuse me, Barbara won the Australian Open singles championship, and Kathy was a semifinalist or quarterfinalist in Wimbledon in singles. And these gals played in the same team as long as, our, and, as with our, and also with our current coach, Lili Farood, who's here today. So there's a tremendous representative of one of the greatest teams in college tennis history. She was the first female four-time All-American at Stanford. And as a little personal aside, and one of our fav my favorites, and of course all my team loved her, my men's team loved her. Uh, Susie's over dinner one night at her house, and about halfway through dinner, she said, oh, maybe I didn't tell you, Ann, Dick, uh, I'm being picked up in about 15 minutes. Uh, can we hurry up with the dinner? And sure enough, 15 minutes later, right in the button, the doorbell rang, and we go out there, and here's this good-looking guy, and uh, Joe Wall, first time I met Joe. I picked her up, 
for their first date together. And 34 years later, six great and successful kids, here we are. What an honor for me, on behalf of my wife, her coach to present our longtime friend, Susie Hagee, for an induction into Stanford Athletic Hall of Fame. Susie. Thank you, Coach Gould. Um, I got life's golden ticket with Joe. Joe played water polo here at Stanford. And Joe, like you said, we are celebrating our 34th anniversary next month. And, and tonight, I have all six of our kids here tonight. Jack, Rusty, Danny, Hendy, Joey, and Betsy. <laughs> Again, congratulations to all the other inductees. Um, it's an honor to be on the same stage with you and to join the Athletic uh, Hall of Fame together. And thank you to all the supporters and donors to make this night possible and to make the whole athletic program possible. Well, my dad coached me through the 12 and under nationals, 14s, 16s, and 18 nationals. He taught me the game. And one of my favorite coaching tips from Pops was, don't be predictable. A big thank you to you, Ann Gould, my coach, for the four years that Diane and I were on the team together. And I want to thank you for your constant support, your encouragement, and your smile. It went a long way. The most fun I ever had playing tennis was at Stanford. Dick and Ann made it fun. I loved playing on a team. It made me feel important and needed. And in 1975, my freshman year, which was the onset of Title IX, one of Dick's great ideas was to combine the men's and women's program side by side. It was the first year the men and women practiced and competed on the same courts. Everyone worked hard, but also laughed a lot. The drills, the liners, the road trips, trips to Hawaii, and the big team dinners. It was all great. But the most fun I ever had playing it was with Diane. We've known each other since we were 11, while competing in the junior tournaments. She still makes me laugh, and I still know what she's thinking. I knew when she was off with just a look or a growl, so I'd step up. And she knew when I was off with a look or a terrible shot, so she stepped up. But when we were both on, it was awesome. I got one quick story. Again, 1978, Dick and Ann organized an exhibition match in Maples against the World Team Tennis San Francisco Golden Gators. Another great idea, Dick and Ann. And John McEnroe played that night against Sandy Mayer, and there was a big crowd. Well, Diane and I played Virginia Wade, who had just won Wimbledon, and was number one doubles player in the world, and Jana Kloss, who was the, one of the top ranked doubles players in the world and was number one in 1976. Well, Diane and I, we lost the first two games. While we were changing sides, I don't remember what was said, but they were bored. I looked at Diane, Diane looked at me, and we just nodded. And as every athlete in this room knows that feeling, we started passing, we started poaching, we started acing. We won the next six games and won the set for Stanford. That was fun. <laughs> 
So like tonight, I shared that moment with Diane, Dick and Ann, my teammates that are here, thank you for coming, and the Stanford audience, and now with my husband Joe and our kids and the whole family, I am forever proud to represent Stanford. Thank you, Stanford, for everything. <laughs> From the You Can't Have One Without the Other file, Diane Morrison made the Stanford women's tennis, tennis team as a walk-on after earning an academic scholarship. She received All-America honors in 1976, 77, 78. Morrison won the AIAW doubles championship twice with Susie. They helped the Cardinal win the national title as well. In 1977, Diane was ranked number 64 nationally by the USTA and picked to the U.S. Junior, Whiteman, and Federation Cup teams. She turned professional in 1979, advancing to the third round of the U.S. Open. Diane then reached the quarterfinals in the South Wales Open while also qualifying for the main draw at Wimbledon three times, climbing to number 50 in the world rankings. After Stanford, she completed her doctorate at UCLA and is now an anesthesiologist. Tonight, Diane's presenter is her husband, Kenneth Shropshire. Please welcome Diane and Kenneth. So Susie's husband, Joe, is so much smarter than me. I don't, I don't know why. What, I, I've got one job, let, let us see if I can uh, succeed at that or, or uh, uh, if, if I can go home and reclaim my name and not be Mr. Morrison after tonight. Um, it's, it's unique for husband and wife to have known each other their entire lives, but we think we, we, we have known each other that long. Uh, we grew up in the same neighborhood in LA um, and we, we recall being at the same people's homes as, as kids. We didn't meet until we came here. We grew up in a world, uh, many worlds from here. Henry Brandon, Diane, and I grew up in what is now a pretty famous area, the Chris Crenshaw District. Um, Diane used to play on these courts, uh, which are now on the corner of what is Barack Obama and Martin Luther King Boulevard, right by Jackie Robinson Stadium. Guess what neighborhood that is? I vividly recall uh, seeing Diane for the first time not in real life, but in a, in a magazine called Black Sports Magazine. Uh, Brian Gumbel was the editor of that magazine. And she was recalled in that magazine, the next Althea Gibson. Uh, this was before, uh, to give you perspective, Coco, Sloan, Serena, Venus, Katrina, and Xena. Uh, she won the same ATA championship that Althea Gibson had won. Um, it's, it's easy to see the beginning of things, but hard to see the end. Um, is a, a, a famous statement by, by Joan Didion that kind of fits in this situation. Um, while she was here winning national titles with Susie, she was majoring in mathematical sciences, uh, the precursor to computer science. We won't talk about what I was doing while I was here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Some of, some of my old football friends are here, and I'm sure they, they misheard this whole thing. I understood I was being indicted tonight, so they thought that's why, I, but that's a whole nother. Um, she is the personification of, she told me to do all this, so I'm just following my orders, of a Wizard of Oz moment. You have the power all along. All you need is just the will to do it. If, if I can just close with, with one um, a verse that kind of, uh, of scripture that kind of fits her perfectly. Dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you, kindness, compassion, humility, quiet strength, and discipline. Actually fits with, with, I think, most of the awardees tonight. I give you my wife, Susie's partner, 
Henry's neighbor, Rochelle's sister, Teresa and Sam's mother, Warren's daughter, a lot of people's friends, and everybody's now Stanford Hall of Famer, my wife, Diane. I am truly honored to be here today. I'd like to thank the Hall of Fame Committee for acknowledging my accomplishments, and now I'll tell you a little bit about how I got here. In the early 1970s, a group of students at Beverly Hills High School presented a petition to the school district demanding the admission of minority students so that they could have a more integrated experience. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Being a part of that multicultural program had a huge impact on my life. I had the benefit of a great education, and those of us who went to high school in 90210 certainly learned a lot about each other. Last year, I went back to Beverly to attend an event that a friend from my neighborhood was, was being honored at. He wasn't able to attend, so one of his classmates accepted the award. The classmate started off by saying, for an outsider, Mike was a great guy. That really hit a nerve with me because I thought, wow, I'm 60 years old and I'm just learning I was an outsider in high school. I mean, I knew I took two buses to get to school. I wasn't related to anybody in Hollywood, but I didn't really consider myself an outsider. When I arrived at Stanford, I felt perfectly at home. I stayed in Ujamaa, the black dorm, and those friends had been the backbone of my support system for over 40 years. At Stanford, I wasn't bused, I rode my bike like everybody else. I'd like to take a few minutes to thank our coach, Ann, for welcoming me onto the team. As you've heard about Title IX in the past, in the days before Title IX, the student had to contact the coach before there could be a discussion about a scholarship. I had no idea there were even scholarships for female athletes. So I think I just signed up for tennis like I was signing up for a PE class in high school, and I showed up and there was a team of recruited athletes. And Anne had the difficult job of transitioning through Title IX, and at the same time she had to deal with fiercely competitive teenage girls. She had the wisdom to pair me with Susie, who is my exact opposite. Susie's tall, she had a big forehand, and she was an art history major. I'm not tall, I had a solid backhand, and I was a math sciences major. But despite our differences, I never had a bad day on the court with Susie. Susie, I just wanna thank you for being such a great friend. And I don't know how we did it all and had so much fun. Um, I wouldn't be here today without the help of my parents who spent endless amounts of time, energy, and money in my development. My teacher mom worked on the vocab words and the times tables and my engineering dad analyzed every aspect of my tennis game. I have fond memories of having conversations with my father in our basement. We had six foot tall computers down there and he was convinced that artificial intelligence could help medicine and society. And this was long before personal computers were even developed. Um, Somewhere along the journey, I learned that life is not an individual sport. You win, other people lose, it's just a loss. That life lesson, as well as everything else that I learned on the tennis court, helped me transition from pro tennis to medical school. And learning how to work as a team helped me in the intense operating room as an anesthesiologist, and also a lot with marriage and kids. Um, Thanks to Stanford, I met my wonderful football player husband, Kenny, who you've met. And we didn't have a roadmap for what we were doing, but with a lot of love and patience, we figured out how to raise a family. We both had intense jobs, and we shouldn't have been surprised that our kids had way too many activities, and they were complete overachievers. Our adult children, Teresa and Sam, had the benefit of Stanford scholar-athlete parents. They were able to go to high quality schools in our neighborhood, and although they were in the minority, they were not outsiders. Thank you very much.
Bill Tarr fully impacted the Stanford football program as a fierce two-way player as well as a team captain. Teammate Paul Wiggin, who later became a head coach here on the farm, said, quote, you can talk about a number of people associated with Stanford football and they will tell you Bill Tarr is one of the special guys in history. Bill competed from 1953 through 1955. He is remembered for his effort, his leadership, his inspiration. He completed his collegiate career as Stanford's all-time leading rusher with 1,593 yards on 358 carries, and that distinction lasted for a decade. Bill was a two-time winner of the Irving S. Zimmer Award given to the team's most valuable player. He also earned the Jim Reynolds Award as the most inspirational senior. During the Ohio State game in 1955, Bill sparked a 6-0 upset of the number eight ranked Buckeyes, rushing for 100 yards and besting Heisman Trophy winner Howard Hopalong Cassidy. Accepting the award on Bill's behalf, our son, Bill Tarr Jr., his wife, Deanna Tarr, please welcome them to the stage. George, you did leave your uh, notes up here. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is truly awesome to be here with these phenomenal athletes, phenomenal coaches. I know what my dad would be thinking right now. He'd be going, geez, I don't belong here with these people. Uh, but I do know what he would say first. He would say congratulations to all the other inductees here. You guys have worked hard and, and deserve this honor. When uh, we were kids growing up, my brother, sister, and I, we had no idea, no idea how good my father was. He never talked about it. We would hear from his friends and, 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 and other members that, that got to see him play. And we'd also hear from Dick Horn, Richard Horn, Dr. Horn, who was our pediatrician and also a member of the Hall of Fame here. Uh, every year at our physical, we would have to hear how great, how great my dad was. But we, we would never hear it from my dad. We had a, we had a couple game balls and some, a couple pictures in our, in our den. Uh, the pictures were of him jumping over a pile and, the, and they were in the second issue of Sports Illustrated. But he, once again, he never, ever, ever talked about it. The, uh, the, the only thing that he really did talk about and, and was very thankful for was being team captain in 1955. My dad was a total team player, loved team, and to be voted by his teammates to be team captain was, was, was very special to him. He would never talk about being MVP in the Hula Bowl. He'd never talk about the East West Shrine game or being the all-time leading rusher for 10 years. It just wasn't in his nature. The first time I had an inkling that my dad deserved to be here wasn't until I was in my 20s. Uh, my dad was on the ballot for the all-century the all-century football team. And on that, on that ballot were names like Jim Plunkett and John Elway and Gene Washington and Darren Nelson and Dr. Horn. And, and, and there was my dad's name on the ballot. And that was, like I said, the first time that I really thought he deserved to be here. But once again, my dad never talked about it. Like all the other great Stanford athletes that I have had the privilege of meeting over the years and, and working on in my clinic, People like Jim Plunkett and John Elway and John Pay and Chris Dorst and Mary Beth Linsmeyer and Nancy Dietz, Patty Sue Plummer, Rich Kelly, all these guys, all these athletes had something very much in common, and that was humility. And my dad was full of that. He was very, very humble. He was also very, very thankful. He was thankful to Stanford. He was thankful that everything that Stanford allowed him to do a kid coming from Bellingham, Washington, in a logging family, was able to come to Stanford, play football, get an education, and eventually become a dentist. Oh, by the way, he went to the University of Oregon Dental School, so we have a little good, good, good game going on tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, on, on behalf of the entire Tar family, myself, my stepmom, Deanna, who happened to be a dolly while my dad played, here at Stanford, my, uh, my, my sister Cinda, my uh, brother Mike, my stepbrother Jeff and stepsister Jenny, and, and my 
father's namesake, William Henry Carr II, and uh, all the other grandkids, nieces and nephews, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for this wonderful honor. Uh, Jimmy Rudder, Paul Wigan, Hall of Fame Committee, thank you very, very much. Papa, you made it. Thank you. Versatility was the calling card of women's gymnast Tabitha Yim Kikuchi, one of the most accomplished performers in program history. She earned All-America honors 14 times and finished in the top 10 at NCAA championships in the all-around competition all four years of her Stanford career. She won two Pac-10 all-around titles, along with NCAA uh, an NCAA all-around crown. As a senior, she was selected Pac-10 and Regional Gymnast of the Year. Additionally, she won two regional titles and a Pac-10 crown on the balance beam. Yim was a two-time regional uneven bars champion and twice placed third in the floor exercise at the NCAA championships. Yim competed for the U.S. national team in 2001, finishing third at the world championships. She also won a U.S. title on the beam in 2002 and finished fourth in the all-around at the 2004 U.S. Olympic Trials. In 2017, she returned to the farm as head coach of the women's gymnastics team. Tabitha's presenter is her former coach, Kristen Smith. Please welcome Tabitha and Kristen. It is with great love, joy, and admiration to present Tabitha Yim for induction into the Stanford Athletics Hall of Fame. I first met Tabitha and her family in 2003 at the USA Championships. I was a new head coach with a program on the rise, and historically we had had trouble getting the top talent out of Southern California because they all wanted to go to UCLA. But Tabby was different. When she visited Stanford on her official visit, I made sure to prep our athletic director at the time so he could give her the hard sell. So as we're sitting there for lunch, he looks at Tabitha and he says, so if you want to come to Stanford um, and be a star, you should go somewhere else because at Stanford, everyone is special. Not what I was hoping he would say. <laughs> Nonetheless, true. Um, and when he left the table, Tabitha looked at me and said, this is exactly what I would want. I want to be surrounded by excellence, and I certainly don't want the spotlight on me. That's when I knew I was in the presence of greatness. College gymnastics is a team sport, and while there are individual accolades to be had, a measure of true success is the role you play for your team as a leader. Yes, Tabitha is the most decorated gymnast in Stanford history. Yes, Tabitha led her team to two Pac-12 team titles, two consecutive Super 6 appearances, tying the highest finish in school history. But that's not why we are celebrating her tonight. Tabitha is so much more than the results. To know Tabitha is to know love, strength, and resilience. Tabitha lost her father, who was a well-known and loved pastor in Los Angeles at the age of 14. And soon after, she lost her ice skating coach. Then after finishing fourth at the Olympic trials, she ruptured her Achilles tendon and was unable to complete her Olympic dream. Just one of these experiences would have broken anyone, but not Tabitha. She grew stronger, more positive, and hopeful. Tabitha gives everything and asks for nothing in return. She never cared about personal success. She was only motivated by team success and focused her efforts on leading with passion, confidence, and selflessness. Always lifting others and her team up to being the very best versions of themselves. Tabitha was more invested in her team and in their lives than her own. Success for her was finding the good and the best in everyone around her 
and then helping them find that in themselves. Everyone in the gymnastics community respected and admired her for her work, her passion for the sport, her humble way, her charismatic confidence. She was an inspirational leader in every arena and utilized her role as a student athlete and now as a head coach to teach life lessons, make a difference in the world, and impact as many lives as she possibly can. Magic is how I have always described Tabitha. Everywhere she goes, everything she does, and every life she touches is made better by her kindness, her compassion, her wisdom, and above all, her friendship. Please join me in welcoming Tabitha to the podium. Thank you, Kristen. I just want to start off by thanking and congratulating each and every inductee tonight. It's such an honor, and I'm so humbled to be here with you. I also want to take a moment to thank the Stanford Athletic Board, the Daper Investment Fund, and the Buck Cardinal Club for everything that you have done and continue to do for Stanford Athletics and the scholar athlete experience here at Stanford. I've had some time to reflect, and really, the core theme in my life has always been family. And I think the importance of family really hit me when I was 13. I still remember I was sitting in a parent-teacher conference with my mom when our meeting was interrupted by a call from my brother. My dad had fallen and they were taking him to the hospital. We rushed to the hospital and my dad was connected to a number of different machines. He was conscious, but there was water around his lungs. The doctors told us it was nothing to worry about. It could be fixed with a very simple procedure but they wanted a CT scan because he fell and hit his head. My brother and I went to lunch with my grandparents and my mom stuck around with my dad and they watched as they lowered him into a CT scan. He was very claustrophobic and he began developing seizures, his arms and hands flailing all around. My mom thought that my dad was searching, searching for her hands. She ran through the doors, grabbed his hands and said, I'm here. Whenever I think about family, this is always the memory that comes to mind. When you're in your darkest moment and you're reaching and searching for someone to lift you up, to pull you through, the person that reaches back to you in that moment, that's love and that's family. That day my dad passed away from an aortic aneurysm and family took on a whole new meaning in my life. My mom pulled my brother and I close and she promised us everything would be okay. There's not a person that has more courage, that's more inspiring and more loving than my mom. And we knew that with her by our side, everything would always be okay. I love you, mom. My second lesson in family came shortly after my dad passed away. In addition to my immediate family and my grandparents, a few people really stepped up to take care of my family. My godparents, David and Susan, and the Chun family, Auntie Lucy, Uncle Joe, Michael, Melody, and their kids, Emily and Mikey. They taught me that there's family that you're born into, and then there's family that you choose. I never knew that unconditional love could come from people outside of your blood relatives, but they showed me how it was done. And I'm so grateful that they welcomed us into their family network, and I wouldn't be here today without their love and support. So as you can see, I grew up in a really strong support system at home, and the same was true for my home away from home. My high school coaches, Beth and Steve, were the first in my family to really challenge me to step outside my comfort zone, to put my dreams and my words into action. Because of their passion and dedication, I was able to excel on the national and international scene, and they stood by me at the national championships, world championships, Olympic trials, and more importantly, two days after the trials when I completely ruptured my Achilles. They taught me to face challenges head on and told me that it was my responsibility to take ownership of my story and my experience. And I'm so grateful that they're here today. Thank you. With all these amazing role models, I always knew that finding that family network was gonna be at the top of my list looking at colleges. All my teammates went to UCLA and I always thought I was gonna follow in their footsteps. But Kristen and my brother had different plans for me. My brother has always been my greatest supporter 
And he's also the person that I've always looked up to. He's also your typical brother who loves to tease his sister. So growing up, I was notorious for being number two. I always finished second, and my brother never let me forget about it. And throughout the recruiting process, he told me, you can pick UCLA, but that's only gonna continue this cycle of being second rate. Your only chance of learning how to become a winner is by going to Stanford. You need to do this. Still, I wasn't so sure. And then I stepped onto campus and I met the coaching staff. Kristen, Chris, Mike, Larissa. You're my coaches, my mentors, my greatest champions, and my family for life. I will forever be grateful to you for believing in me, for having faith in me, and for introducing me to this Stanford experience. I could go on and on talking about the amazing relationships, friendships that I developed in Donner, Zap, Story, Kimball, or the amazing memories that I have with my teammates, especially the six girls in my class and the annual reunions that we continue to have. But I think for me, it really came full circle this April. My brother works for the Portland Trailblazers. And so my husband, my mom, and I decided to go visit for game five of the playoff series. After an incredible series against the Oklahoma Thunder, my brother took our family to Multnomah Falls. Beautiful day, sunny, we're driving back from the falls, and he's blinded by the sun. That moment, a semi-truck pulled in front of us, and we went full speed into the back of the truck, and everything went black. Being wheeled to the operating room, I was panicked, frightened, and in pain. I was screaming out for my family, for the doctors, reaching out my hands for someone to help give me answers. In that moment, someone grabbed my hand. I looked over, and there was my Stanford teammate. Alex Pinchuk. There she was, in my darkest moment, lifting me up, pulling me through, sleeping by my bedside, taking care of my family. Head coach Kristen Smith started a meal train. For the two months that we were in Portland recovering, Stanford Women's Gymnastics alumni and family covered every single dinner while we were there. I can't believe it still. Bernard, Brian, they called me and said, you need to prioritize your health and your family. Do not worry. Come back to the farm when you're ready. They had my back. And my staff, Chris, Neil, Sarah, Anthony, Mark, took care of spring training, summer camps, and the team, they didn't miss a beat. My husband's family, my in-laws, my sister-in-law, they flew to Portland right away to be by our side and to make sure that we got back on our feet. And last weekend in Santa Cruz, after having a rod put in his femur, breaking his wrist, fusing his neck, and having a brain bleed, my brother finished a half Ironman. My husband is the real MVP for putting up with me. <laughs> And he's diligently working towards recovery after multiple hip fractures and tears from a complete hip dislocation. My mom, she's still smiling there. She was in bed for three months after having surgery for five lacerations in her intestines. And I gotta tell you, when I look back on this year, I cannot help but feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude and appreciation for my family and for the Stanford Network. I cannot help but look back and just thank God that we are all alive today. So I stand here today and I'm accepting this honor, but really, this is not mine. This belongs to the generosity of the Blazer family, the staff at Legacy Emanuel Hospital, to my mom, my brother, my husband, my family, to the incredible women who started the Stanford Women's Gymnastics Program, and to the coaches who have stood by us every single step of the way. This belongs to the alumni who continue to inspire me the teammates that journeyed alongside of me, and the current and future Stanford gymnasts to come. I love you guys, I thank you guys, and I would not be here today without you. So go Card, go Stanford. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> so the table's empty. Uh, 
I think that means uh, we have honored all eight of our student athletes. Um, you heard Kristen say, surrounded by excellence. I think that's us here tonight. I mean, this is an unbelievable event, and I'm so honored to have been a part of it. Uh, thank you, Bernard, and, and everybody else uh, for your contributions. Uh, just awesome to see eight more of Stanford's great student athletes join the, the hallowed halls uh, here in the Hall of Fame. Uh, congratulations again. Thank you for joining us. Um, the celebration continues. Uh, there will be a post uh, celebration upstairs in the lobby, uh, reception, grab some food, grab a cocktail, share more stories because I have a feeling there's a few more uh, in addition to the ones that we heard here tonight. Um, let's get a win tomorrow over Oregon. That would be great. Um, and thank you all for being part of the team behind the team here tonight. Go Cardinal. Have a great night, everybody. Still on? One more thing, if we could get all the inductees to come down for a group photo. I forgot that part. So please, all of you, come on back to the stage one more time.